Never forget where money comes from and never forget that is the true cause of inflation. Everybody, welcome to the Sunday live stream. We got a lot of things to cover, so let's just jump right in. So today, what we were talking about is options, puts, calls, and the different things that are going on, and also bank custody. And what I want to share with you is this first clip right here. And you know, if you've watched the show any length of time, you know that uh, from when I talk about Michael Saylor, I get where he's coming from, but some of the things he talks about, I just don't understand as far as like why he wants to just straight up accumulate and do nothing else with Bitcoin. I know people have given me a lot of grief about that, but I'm like, look, uh, most of us aren't Michael Saylor. We don't have a corporation wh which produces billions of dollars every year. We are just average hardworking individuals that at some point, maybe we want to uh, sell and use our Bitcoin for other purposes. Maybe we have massive debt. Maybe we need a new kidney. Maybe we have to, you know, actually want to buy a house instead of living you know, in some crummy one bedroom apartment. It just depends on where you're at. But the things that he talks about here, and uh, he's talking with uh, Saiba Demos, which I have his book right here, Excellent Read, Principles of Economics. He says something that, and a lot of things that make total complete sense. And you can tell the dichotomy between a Bitcoin maximalist and say a super Bitcoin maximalist. And this is gonna get into options, calls, puts, this will get into banks and this will get to like where things are going and how to gain yield on Bitcoin, which is, I think, quite honestly, the holy grail right beyond the ETF. So uh, for the dude, this is about three minutes long, a little bit longer, but a lot of things that are said in here are perfect. I linked in the description for this clip so you can find the Bitcoin Center podcast. But just take a listen to this and we'll, we'll roll from here. My point is, wouldn't you like uh, wouldn't you like for JP Morgan to just pay you five percent of your Bitcoin value risk free? I mean, ideally, I'd like 500%, but I want to keep my Bitcoin more than I want the five or the 500% chasing after well, that. Well, no one's going to pay 500% interest on a loan. Yeah, and I think, I think the 5% as well. I mean, if everybody's got their Bitcoin in 5%, well, how are you going to make more Bitcoin? Eventually, you're going to have more Bitcoin needs to be paid than there are there is Bitcoin in existence. I'm not talking about issuing more Bitcoin. I'm saying that that the current risk-free uh, rate, if, if you have money at JP Morgan, you put in a money market, it pays 550 basis points. So wouldn't you like to get 550 basis points on your Bitcoin balance without converting it to dollars, right? Right now you have to convert it to US treasuries to get 550 basis points. But if you do it, it's effectively risk-free. I mean, it's, it's pretty close to risk-free. It's not. I don't think it's risk-free. I think it's uh, it works with fiat. Once the U.S. government fails, the U I mean, the, the U.S. government's not going to let J.P. Morgan fail. Yeah, but the U.S. government has already failed several times over the last century. In 1934, they defaulted on gold. In 1971, they defaulted again on gold. Okay, well, fine. So now you're going all maxi on me. But if that's the point, let me just make the point that there's no way that El Salvador is going to pay their expenses without selling their Bitcoin if no one's willing to give them yield on Bitcoin. Right. In your world, if you have expenses, you're going to have to sell the asset. But you're going to have incomes. So you cover your expenses from your income and you keep stacking sats and you grow up your stack forever. Well, the, well, the point is, if if the capital doesn't generate a return, it's non -perform, it's a non-performing asset. So you need you need to you know you need to address the issue. If I put a hundred billion dollars into Bitcoin and I get zero percent yield, that's just as bad as I have a hundred billion in U.S. bonds that pay zero percent yield. In both cases, they're non-performing assets. I'm going to have to sell my house, my kids, my whatever to pay my hospital bills if I don't get any yield off of my assets. It's it's non-performing. I look, I mean, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I'm just saying that in a world in which the money supply is fixed and there's no lender of last resort, in a world in which J.P. Morgan doesn't have a magic money printer, because J.P. Morgan prints money. It's not just the U.S. government and the Federal Reserve that print money. J.P. Morgan is also able to print money, and they can borrow at the federal, from the Federal Reserve at the lowest interest rate. Right. So in that kind of fiat privilege system, they are able to offer you 5% because they are printing that money. They're going to be able to pay you. They, they make the billion dollars that they lend you in the first place out of thin air. And then they get money from the interest that they make on other people's billions of dollars that they made out of thin air. That, that game stops in Bitcoin. There's no lender of last resort. So now if you're a 22-year-old and you have a business idea, you need to find somebody to get you equity. And I don't see that as a problem. Why is that a problem? You get equity, you share in the upside, you share in the downside. Ten years from now, we're not. We're still going to have the dollar. 
say Fedin. We're still going to have banks. We're still going to have governments, right? You're imagining a world where the governments and the banks go away. It's not going away. Yeah, it's not going away. And when I'm when we were playing that clip, I could take a look in the comment section and people were like, why is he doing this? Why is he changing his mind? This doesn't make any sense. Why is he talking about yield? It's all about personal preference and where things are going. So if you believe that the government in next year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years is going to collapse, US government, which means all the banks essentially will collapse. Maybe other central banks will, will take over as time goes on. But if you believe that, then yes, stacking stats and, and, get, and getting through Bitcoin is great. However, the question you have to ask yourself is this, and this is what Michael Saylor is saying, which is like, look, I can do this for 50 years, but in 50 years, I'm dead. And for, of course, for you, people, you might, maybe you're saying to yourself, well, I'm just doing this for my kids and my grandkids. That's great, but not everybody's you. So when he's talking about gaining yield and moving from here, I think there's a big dichotomy again between like what would be considered like a Bitcoin maximalist, Michael Saylor, and what would be like the ultimate Bitcoin maximalist, Saif Adin. Because there is, a, there is a difference between what they're talking about. Now, in the end, it's all the same goal. It's all about getting into Bitcoin. But I think we really kind of go into the weeds here. But what he was saying, what Michael Sarah was saying makes sense. If it's an asset and it's not getting me yield right now, it's a non-performing asset. Later on in 20, 30, 50 years, or maybe in 10, who knows? Everything could collapse. But the thing you have to ask yourself is what do I want to do with this and what are my goals? And of course, my goals aren't your goals. And God knows that Michael Saylor's goals are not our goals, but there's a difference. There's a dichotomy. So the question is, what's going on here? This is going on. Options. So it looks like the SEC just granted accelerated approval for the listing and trading of options on IBIT, IBIT being BlackRock's ETF. Michael Saylor says approval of options will accelerate institutional adoption. And if you don't understand options, don't worry. I'm not a I don't deal with it. I don't go into it. This is not the, my, my expertise, but just know, I always thought it was like this, calls and puts. If you have puts at sales, you're going to sell. If you have calls, you're going to buy. Well, oh, there's long calls and there's long puts and there's short calls and there's short puts. Everything in between. It's a, essentially a trad fi type of system. If you want to learn more about this, this is great. There's a link in the description which links this article which describes long calls, long puts, short calls, short puts and how you can actually gain yield between the strike price and the difference between actually gaining that if it doesn't hit these strike prices and you can gain this yield. However, it is a little bit risky. So read the article and go from there. So options are great. And it got me thinking about this because we just had the ETF approved in January of this year, right? It got me thinking to the last big ETF uh, for a commodity, uh, gold. Gold ETF, correct me in the comment section, was November 2020, 2004. And in November 2004, we can see this is a historical look at the ETF or the price, the spot price of gold back in those days. We can see that there was probably some rumblings back in the day about this might actually happen. And just like how we did it, we had a Bitcoin ETF news. People heard about it. This is fantastic. On the 1st of November, we had a peak of 300, what is this? $446 per ounce are nice. And then of course, uh, I think it was the 18th or 16th of November when it was actually approved. So it's one of those buy the rumor, sell the news, and then it kind of chops sideways. Although our ETF did much better, just saying, just saying. And then from here, it just took off like, like a rocket ship all the way into 2008. And then there was quite a bit of a drop. What happened during this time? Well, there's this thing called a recession. I don't know if you heard about that but there was a great recession. And actually we had here, 2008, 2009, a little bit of a drop. And I'm sure people freaked out from a price of almost $1,000 at 973, and it dropped all the way down to 730, roughly around a 26% drop. Can you imagine the gold bugs back then? For us, we called it a Tuesday, so whatever. But going from here, there's, there's two things I wanna talk about. First about the ETF and where it is, and then what there was options moving forward. But then the second piece, when I take a look at this, I think to myself, well, if we do get a recession, what's the chances that, that Bitcoin could stand up? Because gold is supposed to be a hedge against inflation and a hedge against recessions. Even during that time, it would still drop down, but inevitably, where does it go? So with these options, the question is, where are we going? And is this a big deal? Because I heard that ETF was a big deal 
And uh, I was like, sure, it'll be great. I didn't think it was actually going to go through, and it did. But the question is, well, how big is it? This is from uh, Nate Garazzi, president of ETF store, host of ETF Prime, he knows a lot about ETFs. He says, so once options trading on spot Bitcoin ETFs commences, expect a flurry of various ETF filings, Bitcoin buffer or defined outcome ETFs, Bitcoin premium income or yield max, yield, yield, yield ETFs, Bitcoin tail risk ETFs. And someone says, when is that going to occur? He says, I don't not sure, but it's any reason for the delay because the SEC is fast tracking it. So then, okay, this is great. We're going to have this options. You're going to be able to calls, puts, shorts, and longs and everything else. How big of a deal is this? This is Fred Krueger. I follow him on, on X. He's an interesting gentleman. Talks about Bitcoin loans, but uh, the rest of the stuff's great. And he talks about, there's just the number three part here. And he talks about how big of a deal is this for IBIT options. Number three caught my attention. Selling IBIT call options will be a fantastic way to generate yield, which was essentially the same thing that Michael Saylor was talking about. And he says, for many all-in maxis, the idea of living off yield is attractive. I gotta tell you, it's pretty attractive for, to me. By moving part of their stack to IBIT, they can now do this. Now, in the comment section, I'm pretty sure people are like, why the hell would I do that? And for me, I'm not doing this. But for other people, they might want to do this. And this is why I bring it to your attention. I'm not going to go into an ETF and get out of my cold storage device to put in there so I can do some kind of calls and puts just to get some yield in case a strike price doesn't get hit. I'm not, I'm not doing it. But some people are like, that sounds good. And I think for the big institutional players, this sounds great. So just sell out of the money call options, harvest the premium. And in case of a massive rally, accept the fact that they chose rich. Essentially, you have to pay the difference. New buyers will also love this yield option. People like Raul Powell have been seduced by ETH staking yield. This is better. This is way better. Both sides of the call option markets will find ready takers. So this is essentially what Saylor was talking about and Cyberthene were talking about and kind of going back and forth. And the only thing that we're really missing is this, and I think we're going to get it, banks. So this was a story that broke out on Friday. Uh, was it Friday? Yeah, late Friday, and I missed it. But it looks like, thankfully, Sailor told me, uh, credible rumors are circling that one or more major banks in the U.S. will soon be able to custody Bitcoin. Can you imagine that? Your bank, you can go to your bank. You don't have to go to, to Coinbase. You can buy Bitcoin because they can custody Bitcoin. And then what's the chances that they wouldn't offer you the BNY Mellon uh, hot wallet? Or what's the chances that they wouldn't say, hey, we can custody that for you for a nominal fee. Now for us, that doesn't make any difference. We're like, I've already got my ledger or my tangent. It doesn't matter to me. But how many newbie people who are like, huh, FDIC insured and you're regulated by the government and you're backed and, and you're too big to fail perhaps, Wells Fargo, so, or JP Morgan. So you're saying that I can buy Bitcoin, you can custody for it, but I take no risk and I only, I, they're only gonna charge me 1%, boo, what do I sign up? These are the things that lead to mass adoption. I'm not saying it's for us. I'm just saying it's for the normies. And my and the tent that we should have should be quite large to accept as many people as we possibly can. And then we can teach them moving forward. So I see a lot of good, positive things happening. And I got to tell you, Bitcoin's looking pretty good. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comments section. But there is two, there's one last piece I would say. Bitcoin's being is essentially being so big. I see it doing quite well after the presidential elections and then in 2025. The thing that's missing, I think, and I want you to do your own research on this, Stacks. So Stacks is a layer two solution on Bitcoin. And it's been around for a long time. I remember there was even talk about Miami coin and a couple other different uh, city coins that were working together. This is back in 2021. Now you don't hear too much about it. But this is essentially a smart contract that is built on uh, Bitcoin, which I think it's a marvelous idea because Bitcoin is the, is the safest computerized network in the entire planet. Uh, in pos almost impossible, not impossible, anything's possible, but very, 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 very hard to hack and very, 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 very super expensive. Stacks, layer two solutions, smart contracts on Bitcoin. And that's why I think it's ranked 41. And I was buying this during 2022. And uh, unfortunately, well, in 2021, it didn't do so great. But 2022, eh, not too bad. I think it'll do well. It has to have some of these different upgrades. There's... Uh, 
think it's there's Satoshi coefficient. They're going through some things. I will do a deep dive video on this like I did with Core. And Core is also in a layer two solution. I link this in the description, you can check it out. Essentially it's layer two on Bitcoin for DEXs, swaps, NFTs, DeFi, pay and DAOs. And that's where I think things are going. Think about it like this. Everybody talks about Ethereum as like the base layer and then it's kind of like the TCP IP protocol of the internet. But then of course we can build things on it, which is the layer two, which is the bases of the world, the optimisms and so on and so forth. And that will be like the websites, everything's built on the internet. But of course you can uh, expand off that. Why can't we do that on, on, on top of Bitcoin? And just do layer two solutions, have them you know, do all the transactions on top like Lightning Network. I'm just saying, it makes a lot of sense to me, but maybe I'm wrong here. Let me know what you think about that. Check it out. And the question then you're probably asking is, well, that sounds great. When should I be accumulating? You're probably accumulating already because you watch my channel. And I'm not a big proponent of like going all in at some point, even though if I would have timed the better, I could have you know, bought the bottom, but who the heck buys the bottom perfectly? I'm sure there's somebody out there, tell me in the comments how you did it perfectly. But this is a good post from uh, Wooly Woo. And he said, this is the famous quote from Dr. Puel, of course, the creator of Puel Multiple. And he says, the best time to buy Bitcoin is at the bottom. Second best time is to buy at the post having reaccumulation. Again, second best time to buy is at the post having reaccumulation. And he makes this nice little graphical representation of what he's talking about. Of course, in green would be the bottom. That would be November 2022, somewhere around there. And then, of course, right here would be post having, which we just had a having in April, right? April 20th, 420, uh -huh. 2024. And if we take a look at the pull multiple, and the pull multiple essentially is this you divide the daily, the daily issuance of US in dollars by the 365 day moving average of uh, daily issuance, issuance. Essentially, it's taking a look at Bitcoin miners and how they are profitable or not profitable. And you can look at market cycles through the lens of mining profitability. Check this out. When you get above one, it's gonna, it gets a little dicey. One, 1 1.2, 1 1.5, somewhere around there, right? Bitcoin price was 63,000 over here. Ooh, look at this. Well, multiple is almost two and the Bitcoin price is 69,000, but it dropped off the planet right around here, 19th of April to 20th of April. What was that day? Having day. That means you got to do the same work. If you're a Bitcoin miner, you get paid half. Kind of sucky, but you'll be rewarded later if you make it. And we can see that right now that on that day, it was 0 0.745. What are we at today? 0 0.731. So if you're thinking to yourself, man, this just got away from me. I said the exact same thing back in 2017 when I first got in and it was 8,500 bucks. And I was like, who the heck's gonna pay 8,500 bucks? It used to be a thousand. And somebody told me it used to be 10 bucks and now it's 8,500 bucks. I ain't buying that, you know, the, the meme. Uh, but if you're looking for a time, maybe this is the right option for you. Anyhow, that's where I think we're going, but uh, anything's possible. And all this good news that I'm giving you, I have to balance it out with bad, crappy news, unfortunately, because if I don't give you some bad news, you will flow away with too much hopium. So this was a good one. And, it's, and it gets even worse when we start to talk about custody and Coinbase. Telegram bought banana guns, user drain of over $1.9 million. What was banana gun? Well, it was essentially some kind of Telegram bot that, that could do all these different things and it could actually uh, do the trading for you and people sign up for it i actually take a look at it i was like i don't trust this stuff i don't trust anything these days so uh unfortunately the people lost money but here's what's going on it's not too bad but it can be worse so is the banana gun bot hack over despite the lack of information the attack doesn't point to a wider smart contract vulnerability according to hakan Unal, senior blockchain scientist at Kyvers and said this, per our investigation, <clears throat> it doesn't seem like a contract exploit. It might be small amounts that are being drained from the users. Because I got to tell you, 1.9 million is not a big deal. I mean, individually, obviously, but if you're talking about an ecosystem, not that bad. Number of victims suggests that the hacker didn't successfully infiltrate the entire trading bot, only an isolated number of accounts. Uh, there were less than 40 victims out of 10,000 with probably 100 million assets under management. 
And also the transition uh, heuristic doesn't tell a hack on their site. So it looks like somebody was hacked, it wasn't that many people, but just to be aware, the hackers are everywhere. And the question that I've had many a days is <clears throat> we don't like centralization, right? Not great, because you have a single point of failure. Just a problem for a lot of things. That's why decentralization is great. You have uh, not so many attack vectors. Think about Coinbase and think about all the ETFs and think about who's custodying it. It's all Coinbase, except for like one or two. And the question got asked, and this is the same question I have, are Bitcoin ETFs the next major targets for hackers? And of course people say, come on, Rob, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, it's so secure and it's so this and it's so that. Yeah, well, so was everything else that I heard of when I got into it. I believe that Mt. Gox was probably touted as like the most secure, but we know that wasn't true. And then of course, what about FTX? That was a pretty, and then of course there was a collapse there. How about Voyager and Celsius and BlockFi and all those scams that were out there? I'm just saying, things happen in the most inopportune times. Then when you look back, you kind of slap yourself in the face and go, why didn't I think about this? Think about this. Hackers could start shifting their attention to the US Bitcoin ETFs due to the sizable potential bounty, according to Michael Pearl, Vice President Strategy at On-Chain on Security of Kyvers. He says, only recently, the FBI has issued a warning that North Korean hackers are going to try to infiltrate and steal money from ETFs. Let me say that again. Only recently, the FBI issued warnings. North Korean hackers are going to try to infiltrate and steal money from ETFs. So all those ETFs, that's a lot of money. Billions are storing the base Bitcoin somewhere. And you can be certain that somebody is, an, is already planning and thinking of how they're going to steal it. So hopefully that makes it into your dilemma of how much to invest and to kind of weigh the scales of what you want to do. Just saying, I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm just saying it's something to think about. And then also, before I get into this next section, <clears throat> uh, yesterday I talked about Solana and some people loved it and some people hated it. Then about a couple of weeks ago, I talked about Rare Evo, which is essentially a Cardano <clears throat> type of uh, conference. And of course, some people loved it and some people hated it. So I'm going to talk about a, an altcoin right now. I don't want anybody to lose their mind. And the reason I say this is because it always happens. And the reason also is because I just want you to be aware of things. So don't be so uptight about it. Time blockchain sees an explosive 3,000 percentage growth in daily active addresses over 2024. This is a great article. It's very long and winded, but Gino did a great job here. Uh, but uh, all I'm going to show you is this. That part is true. It's a lot of new active addresses, but take on-chain analysis with a grain of salt. This is Artemis Terminal. And I link this in the description. So you don't have to listen to me drone on about it. You can go to this website and you can, and anything you want, essentially, you can add any type of crypto and just do a base compare. I mean, a lot, not all of them. And do a base comparison of daily active addresses, daily transactions, TVL, total volume locked, uh, revenue, fees, price, market cap, all that great stuff, right? And what I did, again, on-chain analysis, and you can splice data any way you want to. We take a look at Solana, Ton, and Cardano. Why did I pick those? It's because those are the three altcoins I talked about recently. And you can see that daily active addresses, this is a percentage change linear. I can put this in a logarithmic, doesn't really matter. But the percentage change, and this is over a three year time frame, you're looking at Solana's up 395%. That's pretty good. You know, Cardano's down. That's not good. And Ton is up 10,000 something percent. That's over three years. And you can put this into one year or whatever else. Daily transactions, uh, it's 1,200%. Eh, that's pretty good. 23%. Cardano's down. And TVL, that's eh, okay. Ton is up 80%. Cardano's 24. Solana's down. Interesting. 18%. But remember, this is over a time frame. And then DEX trading volumes. So... And then, oh, there's one I wanted to show you, though. Uh, this one, this one, this one. Uh, revenue. How much are they making? Well, Solana's crushing it because uh, everybody's using that for their crazy meme coins. And they made a bunch of, look at that, Solana, 1.7 million percent. That is a big indicator. And then Toncoin, 75%. I don't know where. Why isn't Corona showing up on this one? Probably, probably some I didn't, I did here. But you're going to see that revenue 
is a pretty big factor. And then some people say, well, Rob, don't we don't we don't want high revenue because that means that the costs are high. Yes, that is true. But at some point, you have to keep the lights on. And the only, and some of the biggest ways to do that for a company is to gain revenue. Or you can just do high inflation, whichever one you want to do. So anyhow, I will have you look at that. I think things are going in the right direction for a ton. Unfortunately, uh, the founder is being detained in France with some ridiculousness uh, that is related to free speech, but it's neither here nor there. A ton blockchain is doing good, but I do worry about it. And this is why. This is hamster combat. We talked about this. It's a goofy clicker game. I know. I played it myself. It's actually kind of fun on some days, especially when you want to kill some time and you want to keep doom scrolling on uh, Twitter. But just so you know, it looks like uh, if you've been playing this game, there's going to be an airdrop. And the airdrop, I believe, is the 26th of September. And what's interesting about this <clears throat> is, first of all, I played it, and apparently I'm going to get 668 hamster tokens. What does that mean for me? Well, check this out. This is from uh, the Binance blog. And it looks like they're going to launch Hamster Combat on Binance, the largest exchange in the world. And the Hamster token airdrop is approached on September 26th. Oh, okay, I was right. Hamster's Combat's player base has surged to 300 million globally. I thought they were only at 250. Apparently now they have 300 million. That is a boatload of players. That is the largest airdrop that has ever happened in crypto. If, they, if the ton blockchain doesn't falter, it's amazing. I'll just say that. Pre-market activity on Bybit, which began in July, has shown the tokens price swing between a fraction of a penny to 10 cents. And here's the price predictions. Here's the, well, here's the key drivers. 60% 60, 60 of the total supply to players during the airdrop that'll be delivered, 60% of the total supply is going all to the players. That means there's a total supply of 100 billion. That means they get, let me use some quick math, 60 billion. On the same day as the airdrop, <clears throat> Hamster will debut on Binance. Binance support is likely to bolster trader confidence. September 23rd, Binance Launchpad will enable <clears throat> excuse me, users to stake BNB and FDUSD to farm more hamster tokens. They call that a value sink, meaning when you stake it, that doesn't get uh, sold. Tokens long-term movement will depend heavily on how players engage with it post-launch. Because I got to ask, I got to wonder, are people going to play this game when there's no token airdrop? We'll see. So here's the price predictions. Short term, 10 cents to 30 cents. That's pretty good. Like for me, I played this game not that much, honestly. I'm gonna get 668 tokens. What is it, like 60 bucks for playing a game? That's not bad. Let's say it goes to 30 cents. Well, now I got like 180 bucks. That's not that's pretty good. The midterm price, it could go between 30 cents and 50 cents. Long term, it could surpass 50 cents. However, long term success will largely depend on the game's continued popularity and the broader crypto gaming landscape. Fascinating. I will say, I don't know if it could actually do that because one of the first clicker games was called NotCoin, which is in the top 100. And I did take a look at this today and I thought there's no way that this price would, would hold up. And it didn't, but it's still in the top 100. It still has a fully diluted valuation of three quarters of a billion or $743 million. Price went from a fraction of a penny all the way up to two cents. And now it's 0 0.00. So, right under a penny right now, but still not too bad. So when I take a look at this, I think to myself, how would I play this? Well, you played a game, you got free funds. If you like to take some profits, here's what I recommend. There's a video, there's a link in the description. It's called the half and half method. Essentially is exactly what it sounds like. You're gonna sell half and then you're gonna wait for things to, to double up and you're gonna sell again. Even if it doesn't, you took half off the table and you are profitable. This works for all these new altcoins and all these new clicker games. You don't have to listen to this advice, but I'm just saying it's worked out pretty well. And people say, well, what about uh, missing out on like generational gains? Look, there's a 5,000 different tokens out there. Even if you would have done this half and half method with say Ethereum and you got a thousand Ethereum at a, at a nickel and you did a half and half and half and half, you'd still be a millionaire. So, just try that out. Maybe it works for you, maybe it doesn't. And then to finish up, just real quick, uh, I don't know what's going on with the US, but OKX, the centralized exchange, is going to relaunch in the United States. I don't know why they're doing this because we don't have the most favorable legislation or clarity. 
But this is also piggybacks to Circle and the stablecoin issuer of USDC is announcing their move back to New York. Now, they're still in the United States, but we hear all the time about these crypto agencies and ecosystems and projects just jumping ship and going to other different uh, parts of the world because they're more favorable, Dubai being one of them. But now it seems like there's more of a shift and people are coming back to the United States. Now, with US, with Circle, I can understand because they're going to do an initial offering uh, coming up hopefully sometime this year or maybe in 2025. So they're moving back, but it's just weird that we see that and OKX relaunching. And there's a couple other ones that I've heard rumors of that I can't verify that are coming back to the United States. So it's like, what do they see that we don't see? Something's going on. And unfortunately, the one thing that is going on in the States is, well, bending the knee. Uh, Elon Musk complies with the Brazilian court orders, suspends accounts on X. I think this is a disappointment, but... I'm sure there's reasons behind it. If you're not uh, up to speed with in Brazil, I believe in also in UK, they are, first of all, shutting down X, or we used to be called Twitter. They're not allowing that to happen, which essentially they are suppressing free speech. UK, I think, is giving out a ton of fines. <clears throat> if you talk negatively about the government, uh, that's just some posts that I've seen on X. I find this very disturbing, especially living in America, because it's a hindrance of free speech, which if you don't have free speech in a country, you essentially have nothing but a dictatorship uh, and perhaps something else. And the reason I bring this up because not only because of that, but Guy over at Coin Bureau did a great video on just how important free speech is and how it re relates to different governments, tier one, tier two, tier three, and also what that means for crypto. So I linked that in the description. I think it's one of the best ones they've done ever. So check that video out, but that's it for today. So look, if you like today's video, and it went really long, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing when we talk about it's time sensitive. Now, if you wanna talk about, uh, do a little q and I'll answer all your questions the best of my abilities, and we will go from there. If you gotta take off, go enjoy the Sunday. I agree, let's get out of here.